Joy. All right. Well, go ahead and get started because we're already a couple minutes behind time with our jam-packed schedule. Um, thanks so much for joining us in the Partnerships Long Talk session. My name is Jen Loder. I'm with the Reef Citizen Science Alliance and on the management committee for AXA. I'm thrilled to be chairing this session. Partnerships are something I'm really passionate about and I think citizen science offers an amazing platform um, to bring partners together. Um, our first um, uh, I'll, I'll just, um, before we start with presentations, um, acknowledge the traditional owners and the land on which we meet today um, and pay respects to elders past, present and future. Um, and then I'm thrilled to introduce our first speaker, Catriona Bonfiglioli, I, I hope I did that justice, I'm sorry, um, from University of Technology, Sydney. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the um, the elders past and present of the land on which we're meeting and the Ghana people. I hope I pronounced that correctly because it's spelled with a K or a G, but you live and learn. And um, I particularly enjoyed this morning's presentation about um, the Arnhem land research uh, involving Aboriginal people. That was very inspiring. So um, I'm a journalist by training. I went back to uni, did a PhD, looked at genetic technology in the news media, and then I got a postdoc looking at obesity in the news media. And then I found a few things in the last little while which I'm going to show you, which made me start thinking that I should be doing something like this. So this is as much about what I'd like to do as I've, what I've already done. Um, so um, you all know we're living in a post-truth era where truthiness is more um, respected than truth. Um, it pays to control the narrative and um, journalists, scientists, academics are all under attack. And there's the whole profit motive is not doing good things for journalism following the flight of advertising to the internet. Um, public service journalism is under attack. That's a classic thing. You have a public service, you demonize it, then you say it's no good, and then you say, why are we funding it? Watch this space. So yes, there is a war on science. I'm not gonna go into this great, in great detail, but I'm sure you're well aware of it, and the na latest National Ge Geographic gives you a good overview on that. Um, and um, this is a little message, it seems very simple, but it's not getting through, and that is a whole area of um, um, journalism studies uh, research, which uh, myself and my colleagues um, here and overseas are looking into. Um, gagging scientists is real. This is the story of Christy Miller Sanders, who after the Harper government took over in Canada, was told she could not talk to the media. And I've experienced this as a medical journalist from a time when I could ring up, for example, Margaret Burgess and ask her about infectious diseases. She would answer the phone and tell me stuff. And then suddenly it was, you have to ring the PR person and then they have to speak to the minister. And then you get permission, adding three or four hours. And I worked for a wire service, so that was not good. You can find that in Nature, this article. It was not a good time for journalists. It was not a good time for scientists. So you get the picture. Um, there was a report a while ago called Breaking the Shackles, and it found that there are whole methods for gagging scientists, directing inquiries through ministers' offices, uh, restricting the number of government employees with authority to speak. I'm sure there are people in the room who know about this, and so forth. So you have to wonder if they can't handle the truth. So the digital revolution has not helped and there are business models um, to be built and as I said advertising has flown to the internet. There's been a, a dramatic drop off in the number of journalists um, hired. There are more media jobs than ever but in traditional legacy media journalism jobs are much harder to get and public relations and advertising um, affairs has grown and their um, journalists used to be outnumbered two or three to one by public relations people, now it's 12 to one. Um, I'm gonna leave this because I mentioned it. Um, this is Andrew Fowler saying that one of the problems is that the response of many journalistic outfits is that they are exhibiting the desperation of a disoriented swimmer heading for the bottom to catch their breath. And yes, there is a war on journalism, uh, led by some people who should know better. And we're drowning in a sea of misinformation and fake news is a real issue, whether you call it hoaxes, rumors, fake news, misinformation, disinformation, propaganda. Um, you have to consider if fake news can get a maverick elective ad, as president of the United States, imagine what it could do to your health and your science understanding. And yes, we do fall for it, as Stanford has found. Um, and we're not helped by our fearless leaders. Um, the whole mini ice age thing is a, an interesting trope if you want to go down the nice little wormhole or rabbit hole on the internet. Peter Doherty has said that we need to learn to identify inventive narratives and deliberate deception and do our utmost to access the real 
sorry, the power of real knowledge, and this is where people like myself come in. Um, I think I've covered that issue. This is a little discovery I made. I was trying to get some quantitative change over time um, graphs for a paper I was writing, and I was trying to find out what, how does obesity coverage compare with other um, coverage. And what I found was that if you just use the word science, you see a nasty picture. And this is three leading Australian newspapers, the Herald, the Australian, and the Daily Telegraph in Sydney. And if you do the same search using health, I realize it's a very crude search term, but it tells you a picture. And I'm not the only person finding this finding. Uh, co coverage is going down, and science, technology, environment, health, and medicine um, are continuing to have a very small proportion of coverage. Um, these are some key diseases we're really aware of and know that they're important. Coverage is going down. Um, even if you look at cancer, which, as you can see, hogs the limelight, it's going down. Um, and even um, environment coverage, although there's been a massive peak, it's going down. But we haven't solved planetary um, climate change, global warming, polar bears on icebergs, and yet the immediate tension has fallen off. So we've got a bit of a crisis. Um, and I, my research shows that their audiences are not being satisfied by what they're being offered by the journalists and um, people are sharing stuff on the internet without looking at it and consecrating it, giving it their seal of approval, sometimes without even looking at the video or the news story. So this project is considering how new participatory models of health, journalism, science journalism, and environmental journalism can be developed to counter these trends. And I think we need new approaches, and I think one of the answers is to do some upskilling of the citizen journalism training in those three fields to enhance uh, skill, um, people's uh, confidence in um, various skills, including identifying evidence and evaluating evidence and also evaluating news about science, health, and the environment. So I'm going to talk to you about a few responses. Um, we've got crowdsourcing. The Guardian's been very successful, but this is a widespread thing in journalism where uh, citizen science, as it were, is used to analyze large data sets to extract stories of great political significance in the case of the Guardian's parliamentarian's expenses story. Citizen Science is going, wow, what a buzz to be here. This is such an exciting conference, I've got to say. Um, and uh, here's some examples. Uh, there's uh, thousands of examples of butterflies, fishies, froggies, m micro bats, possum dung. It's all going on. It's very exciting. Um, in journalism, um, this is a nice little book that talked about what's next in journalism. Things have moved on since then, but still going strong is one of our preeminent medical journalists, Melissa Sweet, who is the founder of Crokey, which is the health arm of Crikey, and it's very collaborative, multidisciplinary, multicultural, social journalism. I commend it to you in the strongest possible terms. We also have this idea where the journalists are starting to listen to the audience, and that's another way in which citizen science crowdsourcing can contribute to journalism. Um, and the um, ABC News has picked this up with something called Curious Sydney, where they actually invite you to say, you're a journalist, we'd like you to write a story about this, research a story about this. In a slightly different track, we've got Sue Zeebland in Oxford, where they've got the Health Talk project, where they're allowing people with various diseases to talk about their life story to help the next lot of people get diagnosed with those diseases. I think we saw an example yesterday about kidney that was, um, I haven't had a chance to add it to my slideshow, which is already too long. Now, Higgins and Begore have done a really good paper on what is um, critical health media literacy. And I'm doing my own little bit for training my communication students in something which we call critical appraisal. And this has been identified as a key skill needed in health and science journalists, of which we have too few. So in fact, we need this for all journalists and everybody who's doing acts of citizen journalism because we don't have as many specialist health and science journalists as we used to. So it's no good saying, oh, we'll just go and interview or round up or train the health journalists and the science journalists. We do still have some, thank goodness, and they are very expert, but they're not the only people reporting on these things. So um, I'm offering Communicating Health and Science. It's a new elective in the Bachelor of Communication. Excuse the saint, shameless self-promotion and UTS promotion. It's the first time I've had the opportunity to do this. It's a bit special. It's a bit rare. It's actually very unusual to be teaching this, and I've got some very good uptake. Last year, I got five tutorial groups of nearly 30 people in each group. This um, coming, starting in a few weeks, 
got 168 students, so I'm feeling a bit proud about that. We get them to choose a health or science issue. They make a plan. They have to look at um, what the community thinks about it. They have to identify the stakeholders. They have to choose a group that they're representing, which means there are opportunities for internships, or they can just look, do it virtually online. And they have to critically appraise research related to their chosen topic and lay communication. And I scaffold that with an instrument, which I don't have time to show you, but it's there. Um, and um, then they have to make a plan for how they're going to use their communication skills and specialties to produce some evidence-based, narratively sophisticated communication to reach the audience that they've identified as needing some information. Then there's a progress report. And then there's a portfolio. So the teams are multidisciplinary from media arts and production, social and political science, public relations, advertising, journalism, creative writing, sound and music design. We get some great teams together. We've had slam poetry. We've had a little book for children for adults about the body farm. That was a good one. Um, we've got the uh, Panda Sam for Youth Anxiety, beautiful website set up to help uh, university students um, manage their anxiety. Um, and there is no limit to what kind of output they can do. They can do a patient information leaflet. As I said, they could do a poetry, audio, visual, uh, creative writing. Um, I don't want them to feel restrained as long as they draw on evidence. So there's online training in other places. Michelle Goulamard is also offering this in um, how to upskill yourself in health writing. And um, I was part of the founding committee that set up the professional development program at the Australasian Medical Writers Association and that's still going strong. <coughs> Critical media health literacy is the right of citizenship and empowers individuals and groups in a risky consumer society to do the following things. Critically interpret and use media as a means to engage in decision making processes and dialogues. Exert control over their health and everyday events and make healthy that should be, uh, yeah, make healthy changes for themselves and then communities. So this is the same level of kind of citizen and knowledge, upskills, engagement and empowerment that citizen science is offering. I think there's a parallel there. Uh, I've just been looking at fives and colleagues saying that we've got science media literacy. I haven't developed my understanding this in quite the same way as I've been looking at the... Um, Begore and Higgins, um, but it's about developing questions to assess validity of science news and media. So at the moment we're doing a lot of knee-jerk sharing and I think we need to step back and have some skills and personal protocols for saying I'm not just going to grab this hamburger of evidence from the internet and flick it at my friends. I'm going to think about is this good evidence? Is it authoritative? Um, it, is it real? <laughs> um, and it's, um, it is part of scientific literacy. It's not just about understanding science, but applying scientific thinking to popular media. And we need to be able to critically follow reports and discussion about science and recognize science as well in daily life. So that's a really great paper from Fives. Um, and sorry, that's my three minute warning, thank you. Science media literacy seeks to facilitate the ongoing learning of science throughout adulthood with the ability to be a critical consumer of that information. I'm going to keep moving. Um, this is a study by Pullman where they're actually teaching science journalism in the classroom as a way of getting students to learn about science. So I'm not the first person to have this idea, but I think it's a great idea and I think we should do more of it. Um, it also um, has synergies with citizen science, as Stuart Allen and jo Joanna Redden are pointing out, that citizen science journalism can work with citizen science to map the environment and discover news that's outside the newsroom where um, most journalists are stuck inside working the internet and the phone. Um, so I think that a new, we need a new citizen science, health and environmental journalism which empowers citizens with critical evaluation skills as well as some of the basic research and reporting skills that we teach in journalism school. Um, I think these are vital to the health of the planet, humans and other living creatures. I think there's a great opportunity to provide a better voice for uh, endangered species and um, um, I'm working with a group at UTS called the Climate Justice Group, and I think that we need to look at climate justice for um, endangered species. 
Um, and I think that if we improve the skills, we can enhance citizens' ability to contribute to participatory science and health journalism by bearing witness to the physical, social, commercial, policy and media environments in which we make decisions, sometimes called choices, which shape our environment, our health and the well-being of our fellow creatures. And I was very pleased to meet Anthony Duckett, who asked the question in the previous sorry, the session before last, um, explaining how he's working with Stanford to get older people to map their environments in a very powerful way. I'd like to um, acknowledge the work of Anne Luce, Daniel Jackson and Ina Thorson who've done some real on the ground work with Access Dorset which is a group for people with a disability um, and older people who are having trouble accessing um, services. Their poster boy is Calvin who um, uses a wheelchair to get around. He's got um, limited um, use of arms and legs so they jerry-rigged a video camera on his um, wheelchair and he reported on how his local railway station in Dorset was removing the elevator and that it was becoming a state going from being a rail station he could use to one that he could not and that was picked up by the BBC. So this kind of training has a lot of power. Um, she also worked with the Big Issue Foundation um, and it was very successful. I had a lovely meeting with Anne last year during my sabbatical. Um, we've had that. And the other work I'd like to note is Stuart Davis. I haven't had the chance to meet him yet, but he worked with um, a, an NGO to train citizen health journalists in the favelas. And it was, it was good, but there was too much top-down, we want you to do a story about this instead of bottom-up. Here's the skills, go and make the stories you want to make. So here are some intersections, and of course I've had to add in citizen science. Why not? Why did I leave it out before? And... Um, the basic idea is to do before and after testing of critical health media literacy, critical science media literacy, apply the training, invite the students to the students of these um, MOOCs and workshops to go out and have a go and then retest for those levels of media literacy in science and health. And I think that's a thank you to my um, research partner in Monash, Ben, and Luce in Bournemouth. Stuart Allen in Cardiff, who gave me some useful feedback, and a particular thank you to the Citizen Science Australia 18 conference, which has been such a buzz, and thank you so much for including me in the program, and thank you to Mark Evans, Professor and Head of School of Communication, who paid my registration fee. Thank you very much.